Okay. Um, I start off with who am I? Um, I'm uh, a long time ago. I got a electrical engineering degree and worked as a network engineer for a very long time and kind of got burnt out. I was working in finance and so I decided to go back to law school um, and because that's where I thought all the interesting problems were and I got a position as a research assistant um, investigating privacy issues with a professor who needed somebody with some technical expertise. So. After many years of struggling in electrical engineering, network engineering, without making much of a dent in society, I'm less than a year into law school, I was already um, um, able to make changes. So um, I have a couple of disclaimers. First, my standard disclaimer. I'm not a lawyer, I'm a law student. I like to talk about the law, but I can't give legal advice. But if you know anyone who's looking for a summer intern, I'm available. Uh, my non-standard disclaimer for this particular project, um, I did sign an NDA. Uh, that doesn't cover very much, though. Um, they can't restrict any um, discussion about uh, standards and published information. So most of this talk will focus on the published information and allow you to draw your own conclusions, which I think will probably be on the same page anyway. So, what is the project? Uh, there's a lot of discussion about radios in cars these days and um, vehicle networks. Uh, this particular vehicle network, is, it's called DSRC um, for short range communications. Um, 380 meters is what they define as short, they're automotive people. Um, the big focus is on vehicle to vehicle communications. Um, transmitting safety messages and other um, um, data about the vehicle to the vehicles around them. Um, in Germany, uh, they're looking at uh, uh, building an infrastructure to use this mes messaging technology so that they can do analytics on the vehicle to vehicle or the vehicle trans the use. Um, as well as uh, make infrastructure more efficient. Uh, never having to wait for a red light in the middle of the night again seems pretty appealing. So safety is the big reason that this is being developed. The number of accidents, I, I did some research on the number of accidents just from distracted driving alone in the United States. There were 5,000 deaths and an estimated 448,000 injuries just from distracted driving, and that doesn't include um, in other inattentive issues like um, fatigue and emotional distress. So, and, and there are other safety issues that this addresses as well. Um, it really does have a non-trivial impact on auto deaths um, as well as injuries. Uh, World Health Organization, um, the fatigue and distracted driving, um, it's, it's all about alerting the driver to potential accidents. So even blind corners, fog, reduced visibility situations. I um, like to think about a situation I was in where I was driving down the highway and it's, I, a heavy rain started. Um, everybody in the car was giving me conflicting advice. Slow down, you don't know what's ahead. Speed up, you don't know what's behind. Um, this, <laughs> it, was, it, was, uh, it was total uh, chaos and so I decided to pull over under an underpass and let somebody else drive if they needed to. So uh, the, the big question that I get a lot is, will this really happen? Will people really, or will the automakers really um, put these in cars? There's been a lot of talk about this technology specifically. There's been uh, 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 DEF CON talks. There's been other things. Uh, the technology has changed drastically since it was first discussed. Um, but we're now to the point where there's a large scale um, large-scale test in Ann Arbor, Michigan, where they, they've got several thousand vehicles. They're collecting data on, um, on how many um, 
accidents they're actually statistically able to reduce. And so um, when this large scale test is done, probably towards the end of the year, uh, they'll um, produce their reports. And unless something extremely unexpected happens, uh, we're looking at the next two to three years. Um, the automakers, all of the automakers are involved in this project, by the way, and they've got consortiums built. Um, there's consortiums in Europe, and there's consortiums in the United States, and each of these involves um, all of the um, international, um, North American, um, European, as well as Japanese automakers. So everybody's involved, everybody's working to make it happen. Um, how soon? Uh, next couple of years. Uh, the hardware has already been manufactured. I've looked at a couple of these radios myself, um, and, and they're ready to ship. Um, there are still some software issues up in the air, but you can ship hardware before you get the software <laughs> down, right? Um, the USDOT, um, they're considering a mandate. That's a um, a big deal um, because they recognize this is this is on par with uh, seatbelt issues that they dealt with in the uh, 70s and 80s where they had automatic seatbelts and they recognize that user acceptance is necessary if they're going to be taken seriously with a mandate. Um, German government, they're already looking at investing in infrastructure. Um, what is this radio protocol? Um, uh, basic safety messages sent out periodically. Um, uh, it's a whole system of protocols um, uh, from the hardware all the way up to um, the message formats. Um, the idea is that the car will process the data and warn the driver so that they um, so that they um, can uh, react uh, to what they can't see. Um, one of the things, I, I have a lot of questions about everybody's pet project. Um, this doesn't encompass the protocols that can shut your car down. This doesn't encompass the protocols you can break, break into via Bluetooth, which is the CAN bus. Um, in fact, they recognize that a lot of these systems are insecure and they don't want to interface with them electronically or otherwise. There's some discussion about how sensors will interact, but they've already developed a, a strong, robust sensor protocol to interact with that. So, getting into the technical details, um, the radio protocol, um, they have um, bandwidth allocated in the U.S. and Europe, although Japan does not have the same bandwidth available, so they will be running slightly different protocols. Um, 802.11p, I spend a lot of time talking about that with people, it's like slotted aloha. So um, we're looking at fixed length messages um, and so when you have this fixed length, it's much more efficient to just have a slotted fixed time, time duration um, for each message since you know when the message will end. Um, the source address is a really interesting point. That was in the latest revision of the protocol, and they recognize this is, this is a privacy issue that they're addressing. Infrastructure, the roadside infrastructure will um, continue to um, transmit with source addresses, but the vehicles will um, the vehicles will um, have an all zero source address, so um, that's one less source of tracking. Um, probably the biggest difference between the ETSI and the FCC approved parameters is um, the U.S. has more power available, not surprising. Um, basic safety message, so you have the radio level protocol, um, this is the um, this is the protocol that the UIs will access. Um, it, it has over 50 um, data elements, and I've broken down a few of the elements. Um, uh, these are meta elements, I guess, um, like the brake system has all four brake um, statuses and some other, um, if the analog has kicked in, that, that um, falls in that group. Um, I highlighted a few interesting ones, and we'll get back to that in a minute. 
Um, but the idea is that all the data um, that is useful in avoiding collisions is transmitted in this packet. Um, the speed, size, position, path, prediction is pretty interesting. Um, in order for this to be effective, there are a couple of parameters are necessary. Uh, density. Um, you have to have a lot of cars broadcasting this because the, the value is not to the car that's transmitting, the value is to the car that's receiving. So the more cars that are transmitting, the more effective this is. Um, the confidence is probably the biggest uh, barrier uh, to acceptance. Um, if you have a system that's continually sending you warnings for phantom vehicles or um, that you don't reliably get it, good information, you will disable it. If you don't trust it, if you don't um, have the faith that it won't send out things you don't want it to send out, it, it'll be possible to disable it. We're hackers, we can make that happen. Um, so how um, they establish the validity, they've come up with uh, an idea, everything should be cryptographically signed so that um, messages aren't just sent out from any, um, any open radio that you have. Um, the central authority uh, issues the certificates and, and this um, diagram is important because they have identified that they don't want the certificate authority to ever interact directly with the device that it's issuing certificates for because they recognize that um, having that direct connection, they want a disconnect between what the device is and what certificates are issued, so there's no way to uh, trace the paper trail back to the device by, use, by checking the fingerprint that is used to issue the certificates. Um, malfunctioning equipment gets its certificates revoked and it has its fingerprint blacklisted. And with a fingerprint, all the certificates that are signed to that device are exposed. So um, it's, it's important that uh, the sensors are um, effective and um, continue their internal checks. Uh, the system should, in theory, invalidate itself, um, but if it fails to do so, the entire unit has to be replaced if there's any really significant problem with it. So um, it's their hope that the number of revoked certificates, revoked fingerprints, uh, will be minimal because the cost for um, replacing a revoked certificate is so high. <coughs> Pardon me. Um, there's a, the, the idea of having certificates, if you continue to use the same certificate, I think it came up in the last talk, if you continue to use the same certificate, uh, you can be traced as easily as if you had a source address or a, a unique identifier. So they recognize that um, they, the certificate should only be used for a very limited time. The question is, can they be reused if they've only been used a short period of time after waiting um, some duration? Uh, that question still hasn't been answered. Um, the, another question that hasn't been answered is, how often do these certificates get refreshed from your certificate authority? How, how often do you get f new ones? They've considered that um, they just add more RAM onto the device and store more certificates, and so you don't have to you don't have to log in for three years. So it's all good. But then, how do you get your blacklist? Uh, especially if your neighbor's been tinkering with his car because he doesn't want to get caught for speeding. How often will you uh, find out that which certificates get pulled? So now I, I, I get to focus, I touched on it briefly, but let's, let's look at the privacy considerations. Um, at the Mac layer, we have this wonderful all zero source address, so you don't have to, you don't have the ability to uh, track the vehicle. But the, the unroutability of this makes it really interesting. Even if you connect via infrastructure to some back end network, because you're a moving vehicle, they can't tell if you're still in range when the packet 
comes to return your way. So unless you set up some tracking mechanism, which is exactly what we're trying to get away from, then the traffic, you can't have a two-way communication. It can only be um, a broadcast. So as long as they're able to maintain this structure where there's no uh, directly addressable um, uh, address, then, then it is fairly um, private. Um, but until you can, as long as you can't address the routability. So back to the BSM structure I pointed to earlier. Um, there's a field up there on, in the header elements, uh, temporary ID. Um, they came up with this notion, temporary ID, that way you can send messages back and forth to apps. How long does that exist? Uh, they discussed making this interface specifically open source, and they published documents to this effect. There have been um, certain open source activists who have taken a great interest in the privacy here. Um, <laughs> So the, the idea of um, uh, uh, this interface is open source, so you can write applications for it. Um, you can um, look at the application on your car that's integrated into your warning system. Um, they really want people to encourage people to do this. Uh, there are other issues with making that open in that um, the ability to store this data, um, if you have a fixed point or if you have a mobile point, it'd be very interesting and useful if, say, um, advertisers who wanted to track um, uh, uh, shopping center patrons uh, by the kind of car they drove, or if they were able to um, track certificates every time they expired, if they set up a new watching post, they could um, track the transitions. Um, uh, so if, if we start looking at using this for anything other than safety, then we start looking at um, finding reasons to no longer be um, anonymous. Um, moving on to the certificates, um, there, there's the traditional identity validity conflict that we all struggle with. Um, by constantly changing the certificates, um, that's, that's pretty cool, but um, how, how often are these changed? Are they changed once a trip? Are they changed every trip? Um, are you tracked coming and going? Um, um, it could work out. Um, the fingerprints are also is difficult to follow through with. Um, the hard coding into the device is really interesting because it strongly discourages hacking simply because of the cost. Um, it's not something a kid can do in the backyard in their spare time with no resources. So this will become an expensive uh, venture um, if, if you want to um, work on this. Um, and, but the tracking of the fingerprints is a real concern. Understanding who has access to those fingerprints um, making it a secure chain all the way through. They're talking about all the communications being encrypted. Well, if you uh, capture the communications and crack that, what is the likeliness? Um, what is the likeliness of somebody with excess resources, say a um, repressive government, trying to um, find their dissidents in your country? Um, uh, the, I, the certificate delivery is a big issue. Um, there have been discussions, oh yeah, we'll just use cell phones. Well, <laughs> if you just use cell phones, cell phones can be tracked. I, I spend a lot of time talking about that. Um, Wi-Fi, you've got a, a source address there too. Uh, they talk about, well, if you only use them very rarely and turn it off, and if you don't use them at the same time, well, it's, there are so many, so many bad ideas that are floating out there. Um, and that hasn't been decided. It, it strikes me as very odd that they already have um, hardware shipped, but they don't have a really good uh, idea on how they're going to be loading these certificates. 
um, some more uh, worrisome noise. Um, the commercial applications, I touched on this briefly. Um, the ability to uh, send geo-targeted advertising. Uh, sure, you can't target a, an individual unit. What if you can just force ads into somebody's car? Uh, that's, that's been discussed as a, a way to fund this system because they recognize that there's an additional cost in administering several certificate authority organizations and somebody has to pay for that. Uh, the manufacturers are willing to put the equipment in the car because they can pass that cost directly on to the consumer, but they don't have an investment for ongoing um, recurring costs. Um, the fixed infrastructure, I spend a lot of time also talking about data brokers and their tremendous interest in collecting data on individuals. Uh, there's something like six major ones and many, many minor ones that co basically collect data and sell that data um, to advertisers, to businesses, to um, large corporations, anybody who wants demographics or um, I information on individuals. Um, but probably the most frightening of this is the law enforcement. Uh, you're broadcasting your speed. Um, there's nothing to say that a small town uh, law enforcement agency might not want to set up a speed camera and um, use this device to issue tickets. Um, I know I would be really sorely tempted to disable this device if I got a ticket in the mail because I told them I was speeding. So <laughs> um, I, I can't imagine. Um, and, and they recognize this as a challenge to that um, universal uh, usability if, if it's going to be uh, telling you that, or telling um, people you don't want to know what you're about. So, um, uh, um, uh, on to what you can do. You can hack the radios. You can, they're, they're out there now. There are several um, commercial vendors if you do a search on DSRC. I don't want to talk about any specific vendors, but if you do a search on DSRC, you'll come up with a dozen uh, radio vendors. Um, you can look at the protocols, 802.11p. There are um, a few IEEE protocols that were uh, ratified as standards for the system that don't look like they're going to be implemented simply because they require routability. Um, and it's very important in my esteem to become engaged with this. In the U.S., uh, this is being uh, decided by the National Highway Transportation Safety Administration. And uh, Europe, um, ETSI, don't know what that acronym stands for, but it's an, a European Union um, um, standards body. So these are standards bodies. These aren't um, uh, politicians. Uh, standards bodies take, generally take open participation. Um, anyone here can uh, participate if, um, if they're motivated. Um, and I think it's also really useful to consider ways that this could be funded. I think it's an important project because it will save many, many lives. Um, but it needs to find a way to get money for ongoing production or ongoing support without um, selling out to advertisers or data brokers or other um, sources of privacy invading um, um, organizations. So anyway, I ran really short on that. So um, I do want to acknowledge my professor and some uh, hackers who helped uh, uh, break through on this. So anyway, I'd like to go ahead and open it up to questions. If people. <laughs> oh. Holy shit, I flew through that. <laughs> so you have, you've, if you have questions or comments, um, please line up at uh, one of the microphones. There are three in this room. Or ask the question in the IRC channel. Please. 
Yeah. Uh, how long do you think it's going to be before the insurance companies get a hold of this? Speaking of data brokers, I mean, I think it's almost guaranteed. And then that's going to require routability. I mean, that, that seems just like a, the whole non-routability seems to be like a very, very thin paper wall. Um, yeah. The insurance brokers are, I, I, that's not actually a question that's been asked, but it's a good one. Um, insurance insurers um, are, there, there's been a lot of talk about how insurance, like insurance rates might go down, but more likely they're only, because insurance is so strictly regulated, um, more likely they're only going to be able to allow for reductions. Uh, they'll still have to go through um, ha asking um, insured uh, drivers to put devices in their cars um, to transmit that way or to collect data that way. There's a, a black box initiative that um, uh, President Obama recently mandated um, these devices that collect data on your car um, that they can examine like an airplane black box in the event of an accident and that's now already a mandate recently in the last two months. So um, insurance companies will probably want this data but I don't think they'll have enough political pressure to um, uh, really make that routability happen. So. Okay. Okay. I guess, and, and the other question is, is, you know, when they do get a hold, it's, it's not, the, the real problem I see with a lot of these schemes is like any other data collection scheme, it's not how it's actually stored on the box or how it's transmitted, it's mm -hmm. what the security is of the person who's really just interested in the data and not really interested in, you know, they just want it. They don't really care how they get it, they just want it and they'll, take the minimal cost approach to securing it, to, to storing it themselves. Right, right, well, and, and that's why we anticipate data brokers. Um, data brokers, they, they sell to the highest bidder. They'll, they'll uh, collect as much as they can from any source they can get. Um, your mobile phone probably generates more data on you already. Hopefully that's going to be changing soon. So, yeah. Um, has there been any attempt to mitigate the possible identification of users by their RF fingerprint, you know, but with the, the fluctuations in their, uh, their transmitter? Uh, that's, that's one thing that's been kind of hovering in the back of my mind. Um, I think part of the issue is if we have enough of these transmitters, we won't be able to get a good RF fingerprint um, from a single device. Uh, without um, going through as much work as you would have to go through by, um, as uh, following the car around yourself. And one of the things that um, I continue to, um, to discuss is if um, it's easier to just follow the car around um, like if you're following the car around to, to track the transitions in the certificate, then this, this system isn't going to give you really that much more data than you're already able to get just by physically following the car around. So um, really the focus on f things that you have to be physically present to do is a little lower and a little less threatening, I guess. So. Does that? Okay, thank you. We have a question from the internet, please. Oh, sorry. <laughs> so, what stops me from relaying one message from one end of the world to another? There's nothing that will stop you from relaying any information you get from this. Um, especially if that um, uh, BSM message um, interface is open source, you can write your own applications and then and um, do whatever with that uh, message. The the issue is what 
information do you have that you're transmitting around the world? If you're just transmitting that there, is a, there was a car at this spot at this time that was going this fast without identifying who or what that car is, then it really isn't an invasion of privacy, it's just a statistic. And statistics, that's something that they would like to um, develop because it, it, it gives planners uh, better access and better ability to provide good highways and the kinds of roads that are needed by the people who actually use them. So in terms of privacy, there is this interesting balance between statistics and um, identifiable information. But I could so. also send uh, like a break now message or something. I'm sorry? I could also send a break now message, isn't it? A like break? A like it's about messages that identify dangerous zones or something. Like oh, the streets. No? right, right. Um, yeah, actually you probably could. Um, I've thought about all sorts of really fun and interesting ways you could hack this. You could fake out the sensors, you could do a, a lot of stuff like that. Um, I don't like to talk too much about that because it is kind of covered by the NDA, but um, <laughs> I, if you happen to come up with an idea for that and suggest it to your favorite automaker or or better yet, the radio manufacturers, um, and let them know um, that this is a problem that needs to be addressed. Um, I had a lot of resistance. Um, I approached the consortium that I uh, worked for when I um, uh, had this talk accepted uh, to get support from them, and they were telling me, well, it's not the right time. It's not the right time to discuss this, and I have to 100% disagree with that, because right now, right on the cusp of being um, adopted, it is exactly the right time, because now is the time that changes can be made. The protocols can be fixed before um, it's gone into production. And um, I'd like to see this happen, but if they roll it out and it has all these bugs that people like you and I find, then um, it's, it's, it's going to die the death of the automatic seatbelts. So, next question. Uh, two problems you seem to point about that don't seem quite so. Uh, one, you said uh, the cops might be using that to find speeding cars. Well, the cop has to be like 380 meters away, and that's about the distance he has to be these days with a, a speed meter to find a speeding car, so nothing has changed. And second was the using the cell phone to update the certificate, the revocation list. Well, you said it would point uh, who's been driving the car, but if he got a cell phone, it's already pointed by the cell phone. Nothing has changed as well. Or I got okay. something. Okay. Um, I'll address your first question first. Uh, it went to sleep. Um, uh, there we go. Um, these cameras I, I put up there, I love these. Um, it points to all four lanes. Um, uh, going each direction. Um, the, the idea here is uh, right now, the, for a radar gun, you have to have it calibrated. Most of the time, if the automatic ticket generators uh, don't have an accurate enough radar to uh, issue tickets, so it has to be a guy out there with a gun. Here you have eight guns. You have eight imaging, uh, license plate imaging or, or photo imaging um, cameras that are triggered by receiving messages of going too fast. They know exactly where you are because you're telling them that. So um, it's, it's very easy to see this being used um, in an automatic fashion for a more widespread, um, uh, cost-effective way to issue tickets. It's much cheaper than hiring a guy to go out and write tickets for everyone. Um, and the second question was, um, oh, the cell phone. Um, the, they're not talking about using your cell phone. They're p talking about, you know, a separate SIM for this device. 
um, for the radio, it has its own uh, cell phone SIM. So the idea is it's only turned on when um, it's a refreshing certificates. But, um, and, and that, another idea it would have about the data collectability of, uh, of a, um, an ordinary cell phone. And, and I think the point is very important that as soon as you dial in with your fingerprint, the carrier does know where you are now because they have to deliver that phone call. Um, if you use Wi-Fi to get in, they do know where you are because you're coming in from an IP address. And so they are able to map those two together. And that's why I kind of have objections to those two methods. So, okay. Thanks for this. Thanks for this great talk. Um, one idea that came to my mind uh, concerning a creative use of this technology would be uh, sending lots and lots and lots of messages by fake cars around my residential area to inform all cars, mm, slow down, slow down, slow down, there is a traffic jam or something. Mm -hmm. <laughs> tempting, tempting. <laughs> That's my do-it-yourself uh, 30 mile per hour zone. Um, which, which leads me to the question, how would I be detected or, or reported as a rogue, as a rogue transmitter? Um, you know, that's not a good question they've answered in my esteem. Um, I, I've, I've, I've looked at, they, they say, well, we'll, we'll report bad, bad actors. Um, like if my unit uh, gets the slow down, slow down, and there's nothing slow, um, then it should report your certificate as being bad. And if the authority gets enough bad certificates reported, it's able to reverse and find that fingerprint and um, report your unit. And so your slow down unit will work until everybody gets the notice that it's bad. So, um, but exactly how that mechanism works, I haven't had a good explanation of that. So, so I, I haven't seen any back channel um, with, with which could send um, rogue rogue um, certificates. Well, the idea is when you um, download your next batch of yeah, certificates, okay. you do your reporting ah, and you get your blacklist. It's that's a two-way communication channel. So, thank you. Okay. Hi. Uh, thank you for your talk. Um, I just um, not really have a question, just to add something. As far as I know, uh, the first manufacturers have it deployed already widely. Uh, the first truck manufacturer is having it available in their trucks. Um, there is currently the discussion if it is legally allowed in Germany to have it. It is used there to actually, um, yeah, if you have a a uh, convoy of trucks that when the first truck breaks uh, that the others will break as well uh, to shorten basically the uh, the distances between trucks and to get over the reaction times of the mm -hmm. people and it's technically available these days already from one truck manufacturer yeah. I, I don't need <laughs> and and if you think about it not only is that more efficient use of uh, roadway um, but trucks are able to use the aerodynamics better by being closer together so I'd heard some discussion about the trucks but um, without a lot of documentation most of my um, um, examination has been in North America and there has been maybe one or two uh, privacy organizations that have um, even examined this and they've only done a cursory examination. Um, I, I recently reviewed a, a European organization uh, uh, published a document and it almost exclusively referenced what the United States was doing, which is kind of appalling because everybody expects it to happen in Europe before it happens in the United States. So, um, About the um, technical stuff you told, um, this device gets your speed, gets your direction, so it must have any interconnect to your, to your main bus in your car or any sort of bridge. You can even float with fault messages. Was there any way to present that? Is, 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 is the system intelligent enough to, to um, determine false income messages? So let's say um, I send on the bus, uh, my epic is gone, or my car is broken, or whatever. 
Well, this, well you, you told us shortly about a bridge device and haven't um, just noticed it's short. So you have, mm -hmm. you have to have an interconnect. Um, no, we don't. Um, it's, it's very important. The auto man manufacturers recognize CAN bus, which is the bus that all your current sensors connect to now. That's so insecure, they don't trust it, and they recognize that any um, data that comes along that bus is, is suspect. And so this system is um, designed to operate in parallel. It doesn't even use the same sensors. It doesn't use the same systems. It has its own GPS. It has its own um, inertial sensors. It doesn't collect data. Well, you have your braking uh, alarms, but it has the, the interfaces that have the um, checks and balances. So you, you have to have an, an, a second security or a second um, control unit within your car. Yes. Yeah, it's a second control unit, totally independent. Um, it kind of suggests that the automakers, or at least I kind of might believe that they're ready to abandon CAN bus. Although that would be probably 100 years in the future with how integrated it is into so many systems. So, um, so but in the other way, you have to have an, an, an alternative, alternative bus system you, can, you may hack or may interfere with. Right. Well, this will be an alternative system, a totally new opportunity to hack something. Um, for those of you who are looking for a new fun project that hasn't been a tread over a million times, this is a great opportunity to find something, um, a, a totally new set of problems. So. Um, is this protocol covered by your NDA or is it an, an, an open, more or less open standard? Um, they, they're trying because it's not one automaker, it's not five automakers. Um, I was working with nine um, and I know there are many more that are involved in different places. Like I didn't work with any Korean automakers, but I know they're interested too. Um, so it, it has to be an open standard if um, all the automakers are going to uh, be um, implementing it. Um, quite a different question. Uh, is there any talk of combining this kind of system with a road pricing system, which are, as you may know, uh, utterly political, contra controversial. Uh, I'm sorry. Uh, uh, road pricing systems, so systems that uh, allow government to charge a certain price for a certain uh, amount of kilometers. Yeah, when this system was originally proposed, they thought that, yeah, uh, toll uh, payment systems could be integrated into that. Um, it soon became very, very obvious that you can't do that and have privacy. The two are in serious conflict. Um, uh, another project I work on has to do with a toll payment system and um, I do privacy audits for that and it's, it, it hurts my head to think about um, how they're able to track people using their um, electronic toll payment. Mm -hmm. But um, we also provide people um, the opportunity to turn that off. And this system, you can't turn it off. So yeah, it's, they, they wanted to, but it's not going to happen. Thank you. So. In the middle, please. Uh, does the car synchronize time with the central authority? Does the packet include a timestamp? The central authority synchronizes? Yeah, like is there a, a server of some sort or a system service to synchronize the time? Because if the packet does not include a timestamp, then I don't really have to spoof any messages. I can record a lot of traffic by other cars and replay it and have, you know, have the central authority blacklist innocent people. Okay, um, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the packets do include a timestamp. Um, one of the wonderful features of GPS is it includes a, a time sync. So there is um, a time included in every packet. Um, but at the same time, this isn't expected to be processed extremely quickly. You could do some interesting things with broadcasting other people's packets, <laughs> I imagine. 
just might add something additional because you said uh, can is insecure. Uh, if you say can is insecure and uh, it's the same like saying Ethernet is insecure and we have to get rid of Ethernet, it's basically the protocols which are used on top of that. And I think can will stay for a long, longer time as people were thinking because we just have made some big improvements in CAN itself. Um, that's that's true to an extent. Um, it's it's the weird extensions that are the real problem, like the tire pressure sensors. But the tire pressure sensors are mandated in the United States now. So how you lock that down again once the genie's out of the bottle, it's really hard. So yeah. So I have a question. Um, is this only car-to-car -car communication, or is there a plan that um, traffic, um, um, if you have a traffic, uh, no, if the road is damaged and uh, there's a um, Baustelle, in, in, in that the Baustelle is sending uh, announcements to your car? In, yes, actually in Europe there's supposed to be um, an infrastructure element to this. Um, roadside infrastructure, stoplights um, receive it, um, also uh, broadcasts of trouble ahead um, if, if, um, uh, to suggest alternate routes. Um, uh, for rerouting around accidents. Uh, there's been a, some discussion about that. It's been almost entirely abandoned in the United States because of funding issues. Um, there's not a lot of um, confidence that anybody will spend any money on the roads anytime soon. However, in Europe, I know there's a lot of discussion about using it, not just for um, planning and uh, traffic um, measurement, but also traffic management. So yes, that is an extension of this protocol. So. Um, I was wondering, that was not quite clear to me, is it some kind of mesh network? So will one car relay the packages of another one? There's no indication that there will be cars relaying other vehicles' um, data. Right now, as the protocol is laid out, um, a vehicle will only transmit its own data. Okay, that, so. that means we are limited to the 380 meters ahead warning of a crash or whatever. Right, okay. unless the infrastructure is relaying information. My question uh, ties in nicely with uh, the previous question. Uh, am I right that it's a, a broadcast uh, protocol? And if so, uh, how is the graceful degradation uh, uh, done? Because if uh, it cannot be turned off, and every car is uh, assuming that every other car will warn them if they're going to break, I can see some uh, really potential for some mass carnage uh, if I can drown out all the uh, broadcasting by having a stronger transmitter. Well, um, that actually brings up another issue that I meant to discuss. Uh, this is not an automatic system. Um, they, a lot of people have asked about um, how this works with the Google car, um, with the autonomous vehicle. They recognize that this is a brand new, um, untested, uh, fresh technology, and as such, they don't want to trust, um, they don't want it to rely on this. This is to improve the situation, not perfect it. Um, the, the discussion about trucks traveling closer together is a little bit worrisome, but if they have, um, have the confidence, then, um, then I suppose that can happen. But um, the idea is um, also it, as a broadcast protocol, it's slotted aloha, which roughly um, 802.11p, if you want to look that up, um, it's um, uh, slice, time sliced. So it's more tedium than um, uh, statistical like your ethernet or, or wireless. Um, which is frustrating to get on here. Um, it, it's a lot um, more structured, so um, it would have to take somebody deliberately um, dosing the radio to, to cause them to lose that. Let me change the question a bit. How will the system know if there's no data sent from the cars around or uh, if the system uh, is being drowned out? Does it 
is there any provision for, for uh, the system determining the difference between the two? Is it, technically, is there any difference? If you get no data or no data, no good data... No, but will it, will <laughs> um, it warn the driver at all if, if uh, uh, it had an influx of uh, data and suddenly it doesn't, something like that? So um, you've, you've that, that sounds like a good thing to have on the system. Um, I don't know that any particular implementation would have that. So. Okay. Okay. So your last chance to ask questions. I see none. Oh, one. One last. No. Thank you. My question is: We've been he hearing a lot about uh, the getting the information. But uh, does uh, any of the standards that are proposed already include uh, some strategies of interpreting the information, like collision avoidance or anything, like we have, for example, in air traffic control? Um, they have here. Uh, um, this was a, a photograph from a, a DOT test bed. Uh, the idea is um, a, a dashboard warning like that or um, lights up on the interior of the car, but the idea is that each uh, manufacturer would interpret it in their own way in an aesthetic and um, uh, there's a lot of design work that goes into how warnings are presented, but there's no standard at this point. Um, is there any idea to patent this system so that uh, patented monetary systems are a very nice uh, source of income? So uh, what's, what's your idea about it? Well, patenting, that's a, an interesting legal question. Um, these are published now. Um, you can't pub patent anything that's published um, already. <laughs> um, the idea that um, any one entity would take control, there's probably at least a couple dozen patents in any given radio. Um, a couple dozen is kind of an understatement. There are probably <laughs> hundreds or thousands of patents. Um, but um, none that are done in a way that would require or, or cause a single entity to be able to control the technology. Wonderful. Thank you. So, thank you, Christine Dudley. I think, yeah.